Okay, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. My name is Montoya Barker, and I'd like to thank everyone for taking time out of your evening to join us for our online program in recognition of National Park Week. My name is Montoya Barker again, and I'm a public services librarian working at the Lawrence Branch at the Indianapolis Public Library. Our speaker for tonight will be Jennifer Nelson from IUPUI. And I'm just gonna check here. I've got everything going. All right. So this program is being recorded as a public meeting to be used for inclusion on partner websites. If you do not want to be recorded, you can leave the program now and view the recording in its entirety at a later time once it's been posted. This program is made possible by the Friends of the Library who gives to the Indianapolis Public Library Foundation. If you're interested in learning more about the foundation, I'll put the link in the chat box here in just a moment. Now we do have some upcoming online programs for adults that our first program will be held next Tuesday, April 27th at 6.30 p.m. College professor David Mills from Burlington, Vermont will explore the theories of human health that have shaped and reshaped buildings and cities in the last two centuries from modern to postmodern architecture and beyond. I attended this talk a few months ago and it was such an engaging and educational lecture to learn how architecture has changed over the years. Based on what we know from past epidemics or outbreaks, our buildings are gonna look a lot different going forward. And while some features may not impact everyone, they will impact our children, grandchildren and communities for generations. So if you haven't registered for this online lecture, I'll drop the link in the chat box and you can register following tonight's program. On Tuesday, May 25th at 6 p.m., you can join us again online and we'll relive the space race. In the 1960s, the US and the Soviet Union were locked in a race to send men to the moon. We'll learn about what led to Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin's walk on the moon in 1969. And this program is in recognition of the 60th anniversary of President Kennedy's speech to Congress in Washington, DC back in 1961. And it set the goal for the Apollo lunar landing and return within the decade. On Tuesday, June 22nd, we'll showcase some of the latest NASA spacecraft images of the solar system touching on the moon, planets, asteroids, comets, and everything in between. Registration is required for both programs, and I'll put the link in the chat box for you. Now, following tonight's program, please take a few minutes and complete our survey available by the chat box or your program invitation email. When you get to question number four, please select travel history and popular culture in the drop down menu for tonight's program. That way we'll know that you attended tonight's program and we can make sure we accurately accord, record what you think, what you thought about our program for tonight. So please remember to select, when you get to question number four, select travel, history and popular culture. Now during tonight's program, please remember to stay on mute and use the chat box for any questions or comments for our presenter. And to get a little practice using the chat box, if you're viewing this presentation along with a friend or a family member or even a coworker, please let me know by using the chat box how many people are viewing the presentation along with you so that I have an accurate count of audience attendance. And tonight, I'm extremely pleased to welcome our speaker, Jennifer Nelson, Senior Lecturer in Earth Sciences from IUPUI. Jenny, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me okay? I can. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. You okay. can go ahead and start sharing. Great. Thank you, Montoya. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay. So as I go through my talk today, I would love to hear your comments, your questions, all of those things. If you could post those in the chat room, we will talk up through those at the end of the talk, and I'll answer any questions you have uh, then. So. As I said, or as Montoya said, my name is Jennifer Nelson. I am a senior lecturer and an academic advisor at, in Earth Sciences at IUPUI. My email is on the screen right now, jsumbach at iu.edu. 
and you are welcome to email me with questions, comments, resources, whatever you'd like. So today's program, today's talk, I want to talk with you about the geology and the ecology of our national parks. Now, when I was preparing for this presentation, uh, at one point, I think I had 150 slides. So I really had to pare that down. And <laughs> what I'm going to do is go through um, some parks that I think best exemplify the huge diversity in geology uh, and ecology in our park system. I probably, I may not get to your favorite park, but I'll try to answer questions at the end if you have questions about your favorite park. So let's get started. As Montoya said, this is National Park Week and National Park Week runs from April 17th to the 25th of this year. There are activities in all of the national parks and activities online for everyone interested in the national park system. The Twitter accounts, the Facebook accounts, all the social media have lots of interesting information. And what I like about this year's Park Week is the Find Your Virtual Park page. And I have a link here for that. And hopefully um, we can share these links later. Um, but this Find Your Virtual Park is a way to visit a park from the comfort of your own home. So the Park Service has put together some really cool YouTube videos, um, interactive lectures, uh, webcams. They've highlighted their webcams so that you can see some of your favorite parks without ever leaving home. So I hope you'll be able to take advantage of some of that uh, this week. So the mission of the National Park Service is to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein and to provide for the enjoyment of the same in such a manner and by such a means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. What this means is that the parks are designed to both preserve some really cool and interesting features in, our, in North America and in our country and provide places for people to come see those and interact with the landscape but also something that's a little bit not in this mission, but still a very important part of the Park Service is that these places are protected for scientific research and study as well. And so the parks provide a really great place for geologists, for example, and ecologists to come in and learn uh, about, the, about very unique ecosystems and very unique geology. The pictures on here are a few parks that exemplify this. Um, Crater Lake is an ancient, volcanic caldera. The Grand Canyon we'll talk about later, um, Deep Canyon showing geologic time. Uh, Biscayne Bay in Florida is a park that you can really only visit by boat or scuba diving and preserves a coral reef and a really, um, a really neat coral reef environment that we might not be able to see otherwise. So a few terms that I'd like to talk about really quick. Um, geology is the science that pursues an understanding of the planet Earth by studying its processes and features. I was checking the chat room just to be sure that everything was okay. Um, ecology is the study of relationships between living organisms and their physical environment. And together, geology and ecology help us understand the Earth and its inhabitants. Geology controls what kind of of plants or area. So the ecology and the geology of an area are intertwined. And we, we really can't talk about the geology without talking about the ecology and understanding how those are related. Our parks also preserve history, human history, cultural. Um, and history helps us understand people that came before us and cultural changes over time. Now, while I won't talk too much about the culture and the history of the, these parks in terms of human history, the National Park Service has some really great resources online about that. Um, so the National Park Service, we have 423 National um, Park Service sites in the US. And those cover 84 million acres of the um, continental US as well as Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. And 63 of those sites are designated as national parks. The others are national historic sites, national lake shores, um, national 
reserves, wildlife reserves. There's a, there's a whole host of titles for these. So let's go back to this idea of geology and ecology. I think Mount St. Helens National Park gives us a really good understanding of this. So the picture on the right at the top is Mount St. Helens before the 1980 eruption. What you see is this um, cone-shaped volcano with glaciers and snow at the top. We see heavily forested areas, looks like pine trees all over, a lake, a deep lake, um, probably formed in the last glacial maximum. And then the eruption occurred. And Mount St. Helens had, in 1980, had this eruption that blew out the side of the uh, everywhere plastic flows, which is just volcanic material flowing down. We had mud flows and it just, this just decimated the landscape. I'm going to stop my video because I'm getting an internet warning here. Uh, this just decimated the landscape. And so this eruption actually gave us an opportunity to learn about how a landscape rebounds after something as disastrous as this. And so as soon as the eruption was over, scientists were all over this area looking at not only what happened with the eruption, but also looking at how life came back. And so the picture at the bottom right is Mount St. Helens today. And you can see that plants are taking root. There's probably some small trees, but we don't have those huge conifer forests anymore. We have a new landscape being at, starting in this area. All right, so let's um, briefly, I wanna talk about my sources of information for this talk. And although I looked at a variety of resources and also drew on my own knowledge um, from geology, these are the ones that I think are most useful. So the first one are the National Park Service Geodiversity Atlas and Geologic Resources Reports. And you can see an example of one of these on the right side of your screen. These are created by the National Park Service not works, but they're slowly starting to add more and more. And these are so full of information. They talk about the geologic setting, the human history, the ecology. And then they also talk about the threat to the park. What is happening in the park? What should we be aware of? What do we need to monitor in the future park in the way it is? Uh, also the National Park Service websites, the park websites. So you can go to this nps.gov slash find your park and you can view any park and go straight to its website. And the National Park Service has done a fantastic job of filling in their websites with information on how to get there, alerts, information on the geology, the paleontology, the plants, animals, everything. Uh, a book I use in some of my classes is the Geology of National Parks. But seventh edition by Harris, Hacker, and Foster. And this is published by Kendall Hunt. You can get older versions of it on Amazon for fairly cheap, um, but it's a, it's a really comprehensive look at the geology of our parks. And then the Learn and Explore web part of the National Park website is also a fantastic resource. Here you can look up a subject. So say you're interested in learning more about glaciers and parks that have glaciers. You can search the term glaciers and you can see all the parks that have active glaciers or glacial features. So that's a really great website too if you're looking for very specific information. All right, let's dive in. I have some topics that I wanna cover. These are my favorite topics about national parks. And then for each topic, I'd like to highlight one or two of the parks and tell you a little bit more about it. So let's start with active volcanism. Volcanism is the act of volcanic material, magma, from inside the earth where it's really, really hot coming to the surface. And several of our parks have active volcanism. That means that that is happening right now. The ones that come to mind probably first thing is Hawaii's, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park where um, Kilauea continues to erupt and lava is pouring down the sides of this mountain and into the ocean. That's active volcanism happening right now. Another one that we think of often is Yellowstone National Park. And when we think of Yellowstone, we don't necessarily think of lava um, coming out on the surface, but we do think of geysers and fumaroles and these bubbling mud pots and this heat beneath the surface. Yellowstone and Hawaii both represent a hot spot, which is a place where uh, magma from deep inside the earth is rising to the surface and erupting. 
In Hawaii, it's erupting all the time. It's, it's an active eruption building the Hawaiian Islands. In Yellowstone, that magma is sitting right beneath the surface and it's warming the surface that we see. And it's interacting, that warmth and that hot magma is interacting with groundwater um, and creating these fumaroles and these geysers and all of the features we see there. Yellowstone National Park erupted in the past, but we know it's still active because of what's happening at the surface right now. Um, other volcanic parks all along the northwest coast of the U.S. where we have Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens, those are active volcanoes. Um, in Alaska, and we'll talk about this more on the next slide, many of our parks in Alaska represent active volcanism. Crater Lake in uh, Oregon is considered an active volcano. The volcano that created the huge crater happened about 7,500 years ago, um, but we still see some evidence of volcanism beneath the surface. Same with Lawson Volcanic National Park in California. That's showing active volcanism. All right, so let's Let's jump into a park with active volcanism. I would like to highlight National Park in Alaska. So Katmai is located, if you'll look in, I think I have my pointer here. If you'll look here, this is mainland, um, out just off the Alaskan mainland and Katmai is there. I will show you a, um, a better map here on the next slide. Katmai National Park preserves several volcanoes, um, evidence from a recent volcanic eruption. And then in terms of ecology, the bears are what it is, what it's all about, the bears and the salmon. So we're gonna talk a little bit about, about the bears. And here you see them standing at Brooks Falls, catching salmon who are trying to swim upstream. So this park was established in 1918 a uh, couple of years after an eruption of uh, on Mount Katmai. And in 1980, the park was expanded to protect more areas to protect this salmon fishing ground and this bear habitat as well. Katmai National Park, um, it's remote. You fly or you boat in and there's limited lodging in the park. I think there's 16 cabins and then there's some camping opportunities and some backcountry camping. Best times to visit this park, late June through September. In the winter, you can't get there. Um, and in late June through September, this is when the bears are going to be active, when you're going to be able to hike around and see these features um, of the park. So let's talk geology here for a second. The Katmai National Park is one volcano and part of a, a long arc of volcanoes. So if we think about Alaska, here's the Alaskan mainland here. And we know that there's this string of islands that comes off of Alaska in an arc shape. This is representing a subduction zone. A subduction zone is where one plate, okay, the earth is made of all these plates that move around relative to one another. One plate moves underneath another plate. And when it moves under, it gets forced into the earth where it's really, really hot. And it creates magma that rises to the surface as volcanoes. So you see this darker area along um, this arc, that is the Aleutian Trench. That's where the, the um, North Pacific plate is diving underneath the Bering Sea um, plate. And all along there where the plate gets warmed up and magma comes to the surface, we have volcanoes. So all of these triangles represent active volcanoes. And we're gonna focus in here and cap mine. And so again, this is Kodiak Island right here and Katmai is right here. And it's a group of, there's a group of several volcanoes here. Okay, so we, there's volcanism happening here. All right, so let's take another look. As geologists, we love aerial photographs. We love satellites because they give us these pictures of the earth's surface um, where we can see really neat features that we may not be able to see from the ground. So let me orient you here. On the left, this is an aerial satellite view. Okay, so that's, we're up in space and we're looking down on Katmai National Park. The light colors are ash flows, the white there's and snow, the green is forest area, and the blues are, and light blues to dark blues are water and ocean. The view on the 
height. Is not, so this is if we were way up in a plane, way up in the in space and looking kind of at an angle at this area. So again, we see the mountains, the volcanoes with the light colored snow, the ash, the rivers. This gives us a really good overview of this area. And what I want you to see here is we could look at it on either image, but it's marked as Mar Mount Katmai here and here. And Mount Katmai is an active volcano. And in 1912, the side of Mount Katmai, kind of the side of it, blew out through an, a volcanic eruption. And 30 times, this eruption erupted 30 times the amount of material of Mount St. Helens. It was a huge eruption. All of the gray you see around this volcano in each image is ash and pyroclastic, which just means volcanic material that was erupted in 1912. This eruption took pumice and ash and put it into the atmosphere. It actually cooled this area and part of North America for a few years because there was so much ash in the atmosphere. And, and it fell, most of it fell around these volcanoes, around this area. In fact, it fell so heavily that it created a 50 foot thick deposit. We call this deposit ignimbrite. Ignimbrite. Um, and this is just pumice and ash that have fallen, cooled, and solidified. Let's look at that. The Valley of 10,000 Smokes represents this area, this valley that was filled with all of this pumice and ash. We call it the Valley of 10,000 Smokes because when it first was deposited, it, um, it was hot. It was extremely hot. It had just came out of a volcano. And as rain fell, as groundwater and water moved through this area, it interacted with that hot rock and created steam and created what we call fumaroles. And the two pictures on the right, top right, are shortly after the eruption. And so you can see all of this steam rising from this thick pumice and ash flow. And that gave it the name, Valley of 10,000 Smokes. The picture on the bottom right and the picture on the left are what it looks like today. And so along with the eruption, there was lots of meltwater, all those glaciers nearby and all the um, snow melted from this hot ash. And it flew, it flowed, <laughs> flew, that river flowed through or over this, um, this valley of 10,000 smokes and it cut down into the uh, ash and pumice pretty quickly and pretty easily. And so now we see this, these thick ash deposits where the river has cut through. And in this bottom picture, you can see where the river is cutting through, continues to cut through these ash deposits. Something really cool. We don't see this in any other park, these thick, thick ash deposits. So this is a really neat feature, geological feature. The other attraction at Katmai are the bears. Okay, the bears, there are lots of um, bears here. You can check out the bear cam. I sometimes just keep this on my computer and watch it. Um, just to see all the things they're doing. But the bears are there and the salmon, the red sockeye salmon return from the ocean each June to spawn um, in the Brooks Lake area. And when they do, the bears are out there and they're catching those salmon and they're eating them and fattening up for the winter. And so a few of these images show you that. Something interesting, I think they've been doing it for a while but it really came to light during the pandemic was they had a contest for the humans, not the bears, to see which bear was going to be the fattest right before her hi hibernation. And every it was kind of like a March Madness brackets. Everyone voted, everyone tried to figure out their brackets and who would end up the fattest bear right before hi hibernation. The bear on the bottom right was the winner. I'm forgetting what they named him, but he was one big bear. All right, so that was one volcanic, uh, that was one volcanic park. We could spend lots of time talking about all the volcanic parks. The other thing that we can also see are volcanic landscapes and volcanic materials. These are in areas uh, that were once volcanically active, but aren't anymore. And I have a few examples up here on the screen right now. Let's start in the top left. The Bering Land Bridge National Preserve is also in Alaska. And this preserve, has these Mars, M-A, 
M-A-R-S. And Mars are uh, previous volcanic lakes. So they were lakes of lava. We see these in Hawaii right now. Um, it's no longer volcanically active, but all of those Mars have now filled with water. So as you go and you look at the land, you just have these huge holes filled with water and in these holes is volcanic material. Bottom left, Devil's Tower National Park. Devil's Tower National Park represents or preserves a volcanic neck. What that is, is it's the vent in the middle of a volcanic mountain where the magma is coming from the surface or coming from the deep and erupting at the surface. So what we are seeing with Devil's Tower, all the rest of the mountain has been eroded away. And now all we see is that remnant of neck. Shiprock is another example of this. Um, and the shape of Devil's Tower, these columns that we see is actually due to the type of material, uh, basalt that made up this volcano. When basalt cools slowly, it cools into these hexagonal columns. And so now Devil's Tower, where we see the, this remnant of this volcanic neck is all of these columns of basalt. Bottom center, Yellowstone National Park. This is obsidian cliffs. Yellowstone National Park has active volcanism and it also has features from past eruptions. Obsidian cliffs represent a place where magma came to the surface, erupted, and then cooled really, really, really quick, right away. And when magma cools very quickly, it turns into a glassy material. And a glassy material, uh, a, the glassy material is called obsidian. Um, it's a dark black color, shiny, and uh, you can see this at Yellowstone National Park. Bottom right, Yosemite National Park, Half Dome, El Capitan. These rocks, these rounded rocks with a sharp cliff, cliff face represent what are called plutons. The inside of them, or not the inside, but a magma chamber that had cooled over time and then all the rocks around it got eroded and it came to the surface. And so Yosemite and Joshua Tree also has this, um, these are called monoliths and they're just these huge, they represent huge magma chambers. Craters of the moon and sunset crater represent past volcanism and sunset crater cone and craters of the moon actually looks like a lunar landscape and it's just filled with this uh, blocky, rock called Aa ah, ah, that represents Aa ah, ah, lava. We see that actively happening in Hawaii, but here we see the past from what the past uh, volcanism looked like. All right, I could spend all day on volcanoes, but I could also spend all day on mountain building. So mountain building is a part of many of our parks. Many of our parks have mountains that we know that we've heard of. Um, Mountain building happens because of plate tectonics, because these plates on earth are moving around. And when these plates get smashed together or torn apart, we get very um, striking landscapes. So the Rocky Mountain, Rocky Mountain National Park, Glacier National Park, Yellowstone, Death Valley, the Smoky Mountains, these are all representative of mountain building events. And they all have unique histories. The Smoky Mountains are very old. That's why they have a more subdued appearance. They've been eroding and weathering over time. The Rocky Mountains, the mountains around Yellowstone Glacier, they're fairly young. They haven't had a whole lot of erosion, so they still have sharp features. I'd like to focus on two parks um, that have mountains. And I may be using mountains a little loosely with Sorraro National Park, but it's one of my favorite parks, so we're gonna go with it anyway. Um, Sorraro National Park is located around Tucson, Arizona. It was created as a national monument in 1933 and a national park in 1994, and it preserves 91,000 acres in two different areas. The best time to visit Sorraro is November to March. That's because this is a desert and it's very, very hot. Um, it is miserable and probably not advised to hike in the summer here because of 100 plus degree temperatures and very little water. Um, I was just here in March and the weather was perfect and the, some of the cacti were flowering. It was a really great time to be there. So Sorraro National Park preserves some mountainous areas formed by two different processes. 
It, it preserves some old mining areas. It preserves the Sararo cactus, which we'll talk about next. And this park preserves petroglyphs or carvings from humans that came before us. This is on Signal, Tra Signal Hill Trail where you can see quite a few of these petroglyphs. So let's look a little bit more into the area here. Um, let's start in the left side in the map. Tucson here, Tucson, Arizona. Sararo National Park West is to the northwest of Tucson and Sararo National Park East is to the southeast of Tucson. We go up to the next image. This is a topographic map. A topographic map that shows us elevation. The white and the red are higher elevations. The blues and the greens are lower elevations. We see that Sararo East has some higher elevations and Sararo West has some lower elevations, but both have mountains. In West Sararo, we have Wasson Peak, which is 4,600 feet above sea level. In East Sararo, we have Rincon Peak, which is 8,400 feet above sea level. And what this area is representing is what's called Basin and Range Provinces. And we'll spend some time in the Basin and Range here throughout today's talk. Um, the Basin and Range Province is an area where the North American continent is being stretched. And as it's being stretched, some rocks are rising up and some rocks are falling down and creating this very topography. What we see here for Sororo is that in the east part of the park, we have um, plutons, again, like uh, Yosemite, granite plutons, these ancient magma chambers that have cooled and now have been eroded to the surface. In Sararo West, we have the remnants of some volcanism that happened many, many years ago in geologic time. So we have volcanic rocks in the West, we have ancient magma bodies in the East, and these are creating the mountain environments we see here. In the middle is Tucson, and Tucson is actually a basin um, that down dropped or that fell down into the, into the earth during all of this stretching over a long period of time. And as these mountains all around Tucson have been eroding, they're filling Tucson with sediment. And actually over geologic time, up to eight, to eight excuse me, up to 8,000 feet of sediment has been filling the Tucson basin. And so we have this basin of sediment and mountains on either side uh, makes for, for some really interesting geology. Of course, the Sararos are the star of the show here. Um, Sararo is a type of cacti that grows only in the Sonoran Desert. So if you look in the upper right picture, you'll see a rough outline of the Sonoran Desert and where Sararo cactuses are, cacti are found. The Sararo is um, the main, they're the most prominent plant species we see here, but there are lots of other cacti and other plants in this area that are all adapted to a very dry and very hot and arid climate. <clears throat> The Sararo bloom in May and June, and you can see an image there of the flowers. Sararo are composed mostly, about 75 to 90% of water. Underneath that kind of waxy green outside that you see, the Sararo actually have woody spines or ribs, we call them, and the water is stored inside this plant. <clears throat> Sararos are very old. Branches appear at 50 to 70 years of age. They flower around 35 years of age. Their lifespan is 150 to 175 years. They've been here a while. The Sararo helps set up the ecosystem here. They provide a home for many small species. For example, this elf owl and many birds will um, stay or live in the burrows and get out of the heat in these burrows within the cacti. The Gila monster, uh, which is a venomous lizard, live around the Sararo and the Sararo National Park. Something interesting about the Sararo, look at this one on the left. Look at this fan shape at the top. We call this a crested Sararo. Uh, crested Sararos are what we think is a genetic mutation of cacti. There's only about 200 of these in the, and this how instead of growing an arm like this that branches up and out, all of the cells that are forming that branch just kind of go crazy and they just kind of go every different direction. And we don't really know why. It could be due to different amounts of, or different lengths of drought. It could be just a genetic thing. Really scientists are just now trying to understand why this happens. The other really cool thing about the Sararos is they have a fruit that comes on after the flowering. 
And the Sararo fruit is used by the Native Americans in the region to make a ceremonial wine and also to make jams and jellies and other things that they sell. In Sararo National Park, the Native American tribes around the park have the exclusive access to harvest the fruit off these Sararos. And generally what there's different families that each rep or each take not ownership, but take over an area of Sararos and they get to have the fruit off of those. And so when these fruits are here, you see lots of these families coming out and knocking off the fruit. They knock off the fruit with this stick that's made from the ribs of a Sararo, that woody rib. And they reach up there and they just knock those fruits off and collect them and scrape out the pulp. Pretty interesting interaction of humans with the environment as well. All right, let's do another mountain building park. Grand Teton National Park, one of my absolute favorites. Grand Tetons were established in 1929 as a national park. They include the 40 mile Teton range, which you see in all of these images here, and 15 mile long Jackson Lake, as well as several smaller lakes. The best time to visit the Tetons is mid-May to late September. The weather's nice, um, the snow is gone, you can hike on the trails, but this is a very wild area. Um, there are grizzly bears, there are brown or black bears, there's moose, there's elk. Um, it's a wild area. It's a place where you have to be careful when you're, camp when you're hiking and camping. Um, the ecology of the region represent is represented by both alpine or mountainous plants and animals, and also this scrub grass plain, this whole plain out in front of the Tetons that's just filled with scrub grass. The reason for the scrub grass is the type of material there. Uh, the glaciers that went through the Grand Tetons deposited gravel and very um, coarse sand in the valley. And really the best thing to grow in that um, type of environment is the scrub grass. If you go to the Tetons, I highly recommend taking a raft ride. It's not whitewater rafting. Um, it is a semi-leisurely uh, float along the Teton front where you'll see wildlife. Um, you'll go through a few rapids, but nothing that's gonna knock you out of the boat. Um, and guided tours that talk about the local um, geology and the local ecology. So how did the Grand Tetons form? The Grand Tetons are another result of the stretching of the earth um, from, from plate tectonics. And what's happening here is we have stretching occurring and on the Teton side, the mountain side, these rocks are being put, are coming up during this stretching. And on the other side of the Teton fault where this is occurring, the rocks are dropping down. And the Tetons represent the uplift and these very sharp mountain peaks. And then the valley where we find Jackson, um, the Snake River Valley, Jackson Hole, that represents this down drop area that's filled with sediments. The the uplift on this fault probably began about 10 million years ago. So it's a very young mountain range. And they're jagged because there's not been a lot of time for erosion. There's been glaciation that's carved these mountains, but there's really not been a lot of erosion. This uplift and this down dropping occurs one earthquake at a time uh, along the 40 mile long Teton Fault. If we look at this aerial view, we see Jackson Lake, we go along Jenny Lake, the Snake River Plain, that represents the Teton Fault. And on the Teton Fault, one side's moving up, one side's moving down. Geologists from looking at the rock layers have, think that the if we go from the peaks of the Tetons and we see what kind of rock is there, to find that same rock, to match it up on the other side of the fault, we would have to go 25,000 feet down. Um, that's how far this fault has, uh, uh, has adjusted over geologic time. So when an earthquake occurs here, a big earthquake, we're talking like seven to eight, 7.5 earthquakes. When an earthquake occurs here, the uplifting side usually moves up two or three feet. The down dropping side usually moves down four to six feet. And so that has just been happening and happening and happening over geologic time and creating these mountain peaks. Um, the last, significant earthquake on the Teton Fault was about 5,900 years ago. It'll happen again um, 
but we don't really know when and we don't know how big. Little earthquakes here happen all the time, which makes small adjustments. The other couple other great things about Teton Park or interesting things are the glaciers. So this, this area was glaciated in the last glacial maximum and the glaciers, there's remnants of the glaciers still there. We see, this is the Alaska Basin. This is near the some of the peaks of the Tetons. And this represents a cirque or a place where a glacier started in the geologic past. Here we can find polished rocks that have been almost sandblasted and sandpapered by these moving glaciers. We can also see in some of the upper ranges, the leftovers of glaciers. There are 11 glaciers still in, glacier, or in, Teton, in the Tetons None of them are advancing, so none of them are growing. Many of them are retreating and several of them are stagnant or they're just sitting there. They're no longer active glaciers. And these are gonna to continue to go away as the, as the planet continues to warm. The wildlife here, um, like I said, there's moose, there's bison, there's elk, there's bears. There, um, the, this picture in the upper right is the famous bear named 399. That's her number from biologists. Uh, this bear has been in the park for, um, or is, this bear is 25 years old. So she's been around for a while. She's had 16 cubs. And she recently, last year, when she came out of hibernation, came out of hibernation with four cubs. She's already famous for having triple every time she has, um, which is a little bit more rare with uh, bears with these grizzly, or these, yeah, these grizzly bears. Uh, but last winter, she came out of hibernation with four, which has made her super famous. She has her own Facebook page and Twitter page. You should check her out. But she came out four days ago. Um, we, the scientists were worried that with four cubs to feed over a long winter and her age, that she may not make it. And they weren't sure if the cubs would make it. Uh, but this picture was proof that they made it and they're out again. Another interesting fact about bear 399 is that she knows to look both ways before crossing the road. <laughs> if you want to see more glaciers and glaciation, um, you can visit Glacier National Park, you can visit Mount Rainier, you can visit Denali, see glaciers in those places. In the eastern United States, you can see the remnants of continental glaciation. So Sleeping Bear Dunes, Indiana Dunes, um, the Ice Age Trail of Wisconsin all show us past glaciation. All right, let's move forward to erosion and weathering. Erosion and weathering are the breakdown of rocks. And when I talk about erosion and weathering, these are, we see this in all of our parks, but the ones that come to mind most of all are the ones of the Colorado Plateau. The Colorado Plateau is an area of um, sedimentary rock layers that um, have been uplifted and are now being downcut and eroded by rivers flowing over the landscape. We have so many parks here in the, um, in, in the Colorado Plateau. And this image on the left, this map on the left is showing you all of these. And then the pictures on the right. And all of these show us this erosion and this weathering and rock layers. There's fossils, there's um, ruins of ancient civilizations uh, just a lot of geology in one small area that you can uh, spend so much time in to see everything. The Colorado Plateau, the area, is also called by geologists the Grand Staircase. And it's called this because if we look at the rock layers, we see these layers and layers and layers of rock that have been relatively not deformed. So a lot of times, plate tectonics, mountain building, all of that will deform rocks. But these really haven't been deformed too much. There's been a little bit of uplift around the Grand Canyon and some faulting, but this grand staircase, this idea is that we can start somewhere like Cedar Breaks or Bryce Canyon National Park, and we can visit parks all the way through Zion, the Vermilion Cliffs, the Painted Desert to the Grand Canyon, and we can put together a vast geologic history from very recent sediments to very, very old igneous and um, metamorphic rocks in the base of the Grand Canyon. So in Zion Canyon, for example, the oldest rocks in Zion are the youngest rocks in the Grand Canyon. So for geologists, this makes us really excited because we can put together 
a history of the North American continent over this region by going to each of these locations. Um, again, this is just showing you some of those layers. You can see the light and the dark colored layers that make up all of these rocks. Another park that exemplifies weathering and erosion are the Great Sand Dunes in Colorado. This park was established as a national monument in 1932. It became a national park in 2004, and it preserves the tallest sand dunes in North America. We have sand dunes here, we have mountains, we have waterfalls, we have um, animals and birds. And this park is also an international dark sky park, which means at night, the stargazing and seeing the Milky Way is amazing. So how did this form? Over geologic time, in the past, there was a lake in the basin um, to the kind of southwest of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. And over time, that lake built up and built up, and it put a lot of pressure on, its, on the floor of the lake, on the lake bed. And that pressure fractured the rocks and caused that lake to drain through the fractures. What was left were just some small lakes and a bunch of sediment that had drained off the mountains into that lake. Now, in this area, winds concentrate the sand. Storm winds blow over the mountains and the prevailing winds blow from the opposite direction. And so all of this lake bed sand is just being concentrated and moved around in this one lo location. And so in the image on the right, you can see again, the mountains and the sand area and the great dunes. The great dunes represent the place where, the, where most of the sand, like 90% of the sand is. The rest of the sand is over in the Aeolian sand area. And here in the great sand dunes, the rivers that surround the dunes constantly rework the sand, but keep it in that one location along with the winds. And so we can study dune formation and dune, um, dune features here um, in this very unique area. In terms of ecology, we have mountainous regions with alpine plants and animals, and we have some of the plants that you might expect in a desert with these sand dunes. This is blowout grass. Um, and this grass, as it blows in the wind, it makes these circles in the sand, which is a really cool thing to see. We have wetlands where the groundwater has reached the surface, and we have rivers that flow around the dunes in this area. This is a really cool park to visit. You travel down this long dirt road, gravel road to get there, um, but it's just beautiful when you get there. Um, and the place that we stayed was a lodge, and there were hummingbirds everywhere, and it was just amazing to see them all over the place. All right, I'll keep jumping ahead. Another popular geology topic is always fossils. Fossils are the remains of past life, and we have an extensive geologic history on Earth, and lots of plants and animals have um, appeared and disappeared over time. Places to see fossils, we could probably take just about any of our parks and talk about some fossils there. Some are more famous for their fossils, some are less. Um, there are some examples here. Glacier National Park has these things called stromatolites, which are these very, very old algae features that used to grow, these algae that used to grow in like a tropical ocean. In Yellowstone, we have petrified wood. In the Badlands, we have all kinds of cool fossils, which I'll talk about next. Um, dinosaur National Monument preserves dinosaur fossils. Zion has some dinosaur prints in the rocks. So lots of our parks have fossils. Um, definitely go see the subject page for the fossils in parks to see all of them. All right, so let's look at Badlands National Park. The Badlands National Park is in South Dakota. It was formed in 1929 as a national monument and a national park in 1978. This is the world's richest Oligocene age fo vertebrate fossil deposit. Um, Oligocene was 33.9 to 23 million years ago. Vertebrate fossils, mostly mammals. Um, we have a rich record of mammals that no longer exist, but did in the past. Best time to visit, late August to October. It gets hot here too. Um, and that's a good time when the weather is pretty decent. Um, Biking is very popular in this park, biking around all of the uh, Badland deposits. 
we have these things here on the lower left um, called, I forget what they're called, sorry. But these are, uh, this top part is sod and it's been eroded away and you can see the rock underneath the sod. And what this actually allows scientists to do is study prairie grasses in a vertical format and try to understand how prairies and how sod and soil form over time. This little guy in the upper left is a, um, sorry, I'm drawing a blank. He's cute. I'll tell you what his name is. He's a ferret. He's a black-footed ferret. There we go. Um, these we were thought to be extinct and uh, they were reintroduced to the park and they're slowly growing. They're still considered endangered, but they're slowly growing back in, um, in abundance. So the fossils, the Badlands have been a fossil location. This is why this park was formed because it's such a rich fossil location um, and being studied by universities around the world. This area, the rocks here represent a transition from a shallow sea to a warm wet floodplain and then to a savanna grassland type environment. And the conditions were just right to preserve all kinds of fossils of a cat-like species, this marine, alligator reptile thing, um, ammonites, which are a type of mollusk, this bronothier, which is like um, a rhinoceros type of mammal. But there's some really cool things. And then the picture in the background is a college student that discovered a triceratop fossil in this region as well. <clears throat> All right, so let's end with water. If we look at our parks, almost, I would say every park has some form of water that is shaping the park. We can think of Zion and Slot Canyon and the movement of water creating that, um, those really interesting canyons. Uh, Cayuga Valley in Ohio is a river valley shaped by water. The Everglades have rivers and caves and karst topography that makes this place unique. Uh, Pictured Rocks has, the, has Lake Michigan shaping the shoreline. We're gonna look at Congaree and Mammoth Cave as our water parks. So let's start with Mammoth Cave. This one might be a little bit more familiar. This one is in Kentucky. It was authorized in 1926 to be a park, but not, didn't become a park until 1941. It's the largest cave system in the world. We have 400 miles of explored caves in this, re, in this Mammoth Mammoth Caves, I think there's 600 more miles that we haven't explored. Only 10 of those miles of cave are explorable by people as part of the national park system. The, the caves were, are there all because of sandstone. So sandstone is a rock um, and it's a rock that sits at the surface above Mammoth Cave. And what that sandstone does is it allows water from the surface, rainwater, for example, groundwater, to move into deeper layers of limestone below, but not totally erode that lime, totally erode the sandstone. So the sandstone protects the limestone from being just completely eroded away where we all we would see is sinkholes at the surface. There's probably five levels of caves at Mammoth Cave National Park. Um, most of the large cave passages are on level two and three. And then the current level of the river and the water that is carving these caves is at, on level five. That level changes over time because all of this groundwater is flowing towards the Green River. And you can see that in this upper left picture. Here's the Green River. Here's the Mammoth Cave system. As the Green River continues to downcut into its valley, the groundwater keeps trying to go towards the Green River and it just keeps cutting lower and lower. Uh, um, you can see the also features here, cave has these deep vertical shafts. And if we get to the lowest parts of the cave, we can see that river and where it's at right now. The plants and animal, animals of Mammoth Cave are also very interesting and unique. Um, at the surface, it's similar to what we might have in Indiana. We have a forest, we have deer, um, but it's the cave life that's really interesting. We have bats in the cave. The cave um, is, is home to a number of bat species, including the endangered Indiana bat. Um, we have cave salamanders, cave fish, cave crawfish that are blind and 
completely clear because it's dark there. They don't need to have eyes or color. And we have cave crickets. And all of these are there because of the unique system. Um, I forgot to mention earlier, the best time to visit Mammoth Cave is anytime. It stays a consistent 54 degrees under the surface. So it's a, it's a year round type of park. You might wanna avoid like the times when school's in session because there's lots of kids and field trips here. All right, I know I'm running out of time. So I wanna go ahead to Congaree National Park, South Carolina. This was a national monument established as a national monument in 1976 and as a national park in 2003. It preserves an 11,000 acre old growth hardwood forest with cypress trees, um, swamp cypress and broadleaf trees. This is an area that somehow escaped humans coming through and completely cutting down all the trees in the landscape for agriculture. There are huge, huge trees here. Um, some of these are anywhere from 90 to 120 feet tall, um, old, 150 to 500 year old trees. This is also a swamp. It's a floodplain. And so when it floods here, um, the swamp area becomes a great place to kayak and see some really unique species. Um, the, the otter is not unique, but it's a really cool species that you see here. You see them playing around in the swamp. This area is on the upper coastal plain of South Carolina, which represents a place where sea level once was. This was once the coast in the geologic past when sea level was much, much higher. And then as sea level lowered, rivers went across this landscape and cut into the valleys and cut into the valleys that we now see as Congaree National Park. Best time to visit, spring and fall, not as hot, not so many bugs. Um, the rivers are down a little bit. And so you can actually kayak and walk on the boardwalks through the swamps. All right, I hope some of this has made you ready to visit your parks. Um, and we're getting hopefully to the point with this pandemic where we can get out and explore some more. A couple of things I would like you to keep in mind though, parks have entrance fees, but you can also get these passes, um, senior passes, military passes, disability. The National Park Service has this fourth grade pass. So any fourth grader for the whole year they're in fourth grade can visit a park for free. You should also check for active alerts. Because these are wild and natural landscapes, that sometimes there's things going on, wildfires, flooding, um, rock falls, bear activity that might close parts of the park. So it's always good to check on the park website before you go. You can get recreation passes, um, annual and lifetime passes, and you can also get maps online. People love our parks. Um, you can see this is Zion and people going to climb rocks at Zion. This is the entrance. Um, this to Grand Canyon. So it's good to find times to visit when they're not as busy and you won't be so frustrated by having just tons of people around. We all want to see these places. Um, all right, that is it. I know I'm right at the end of my time. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned some things about some of your parks. I'm leaving you with a picture of one of my other favorite places, which is the Beartooth Pass and the Beartooth Highway. You can see the highway down here. This is in Montana and this beautiful glacial valley. Again, my email is here, jsunbach at iu.edu, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have.